Thanks for tuning in to another Dolphins podcast. The bye week is in the books, and we're turning our attention to the Colts. We have a packed show for you today, loaded with injury updates. But before we turn the page to Josh, dare I say it, week seven. How are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing good. The kids are off, so I've been a little bit uh, frantically running around this morning. But, you know, we couldn't lose, so I'm doing better than we were a few weeks ago. So ready for the second part, I guess, of the season, Jay. And just happy to be able to come on here and talk about the weekend that we just endured. How have you been, man? Good week. Good week of fantasy. So far, got two wins under my belt. And Josh, I heard there were some pancakes being made over at the Houts household. So I wanted to get your thoughts. I went out to breakfast the other day and I went with the French toast. What, what, what do you usually go to? Would you Are you a pancake guy or French toast guy? Yeah, I mean, I guess it kind of – I'm normally a waffle guy, honestly, nice. like a Belgian waffle, like one of those – like the, yeah, so I fill every hole with syrup, a little bit of butter. So I was always a Belgian waffle guy. But, yeah, the older I get, I start to respect French toast more. And, you know, some of those places are doing crazy, like, stuffed things and using different brioches and things. So, yeah, I can respect French toast for sure. Did you ever stuff a piece of toast with, like, cream cheese or something? Do you have experience doing that? I did, but the way they do it is they just basically make two big uh, – they use, like, Texas toast, and then they just put, like, some kind of cream cheese, like strawberry cream cheese in between two pieces, and that's, that's their uh, generic stuff. So, yeah, I mean, you can make a pocket, but that's how I first saw it, and I was like, okay, my head exploded a little bit. I was like, you guys took the easy Head exploded full of cream cheese, Josh. That's the only way I could describe that. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Tex- or, uh, little little French toast to begin the day. That's how you set the tone on the Sunday. After a week of not having to worry about the Miami Dolphins, Mike McDaniel met with the media Monday morning, and my, oh my, was this a long list of injuries he had to discuss, and Josh, we have to start with the most important. Catching up on all the injuries, quarterback Tua Tungabailoa must miss one more game before he is eligible to be activated off of injured reserve. He suffered a concussion in week two against the Buffalo Bills. There was some confusion, Josh. A lot of people were actually under the impression that uh, week seven against the Colts is when Tua could come back. Um, The issue here is that the bye week does not count as one of the weeks before you can come off of injured reserve. They basically set it up so you have to miss six games because there were teams trying to work the system, different things like that. So, what did Mike McDaniel have to say, Josh? Are we going to see Tua Tungabailoa in the near future? Yeah, well, I just want to uh, give a shout out to you because I think you corrected me on one of the pods. And, you know, you said that he was going to miss that Colts game as well. So um, if you were still confused, you need to start subscribing to the podcast. So uh, Mike McDaniel met with the media this morning and I tried to, you know, lurk as much as I can because they're on YouTube. And uh, they asked him, you know, how have the meetings with co- uh, the consultations with the experts gone for Tua? And Mike McDaniel said they continue to be positive. There's still information that he's seeking this week. As far as a timeline goes, I know he's not playing this week, but I do expect him to play football in 2024. Where that is exactly, we'll let the process continue. He then announced that Snoop Huntley will be starting against the Colts. But as far as we know, Tua Tavaloa sounds like he's on track. You mentioned him having to miss another game, and at that point, he's just coming back to practice, and it sounds like he'll be ready to go sooner rather than later. So what were your thoughts from that, Jake? I mean, I am at least a little bit relieved that we're going to see him again, but I don't think at any point throughout this entire process we thought he was hanging up the cleats based on everything we heard. Yeah, him flying all the way to Seattle with the team and being on the sideline one week after it happened, that was his Jordan facts. That was him telling the entire NFL, like, I'm going to be back. I'm not planning to go anywhere. And um, at the end of the day, it's his choice. If if he gets all the, the, the right news from the doctors and he feels comfortable going back on the field, based on everything we've heard from the Schefters, all the types of insiders, Josh, it does seem like we're heading towards a world where he would be starting next week for the Miami Dolphins against the Colts. Is that where you're leaning? I mean, Mike McDaniel is always going to be a politician with this stuff, and rightfully so. And it would not be fair um, to give out timelines. I know we want to hear the timelines. Like, we can't wait to have so-and-so back in whatever week it may be. I, I think Mike McDaniel is doing the right thing here. I know it frustrates a lot of fans. And we have a bunch of stuff we can be frustrated at Mike McDaniel for. I don't think it's something like this. I think he's just always going to keep it simple and the point having to deal with this so often all these different types of injuries through the last three years I think he's just kind of got it down to a T this is the injury it's mathematically impossible for him to play this week so I can say he's not going to play this week from there yeah he'll play again and I'll leave it at that it just kind of seems like that's where we've reached in the Mike McDaniel saga 
Yeah, and I'm okay with this because let's be honest, we could see uh, you know Snoop Huntley go out there and play very good football, and then you know maybe the Dolphins feel like they don't have to rush him back, so to speak. But when you're paying that much money, you know they want to get two out there, and two wants to get out there as quickly as he can. So um, it's definitely going to happen sooner or later. I guess the one thing I would say is you mentioned it. You can't be mad at Mike McDaniel for the way he handles these injuries. So maybe in a world the Dolphins you know, do do slowly bring him back. But again, this season's kind of almost in the balance at this point, where when he's ready, he's going to be out there. When you think or when you listen to these quotes from Mike McDaniel, Josh, I mean, we've been covering the Dolphins and I say covering, writing stories, following the team, uh, digesting these quotes, figuring out since the Joe Philbin days. I think that's a fair way to put it. Like, that's when I got deep. Cut me off if you think you've been doing this longer. Do you see Mike McDaniel's um, pressers kind of like Joe Philbin? I think one of the biggest gripes about Philbin otherwise, other than the fact that the team was brutal, was he would just dance around every single type of question where it would be a non-answer. I don't necessarily think that that's what Mike McDaniel is doing here, but I also know that um, a lot of people don't really feel the same way. Yeah, and it's funny because, like, when we were winning games, I would watch the pressers and I'd feel like, okay, I like this coach. You know, it's a little bit of his – the cute – the yes. cutest – I don't want to say cutest, but a little bit of who he is, is. right? Like, is, he's, he kind of has, like, the ADHD and he, when he dances and just goes from one subject to the next, and I can absolutely relate to that. But when the Dolphins are losing, you're sitting there and you're listening to him like, come on, man, get to the point. And I'm sitting there listening to it today, and I'm like – uh, I feel so bad for whoever's writing up these transcripts. So I think there's a lot more uh, genius behind Mike McDaniel than maybe Joe Philbin. But as far as, you know, him just going on and on and kind of dancing around the obvious question, I can definitely see the similarities there. And that means we'll see Snoop Huntley get his third straight start for the Miami Dolphins. And man, you can look at the two games and say the Dolphins are averaging a monster 13 points per game. But I really thought that last week, Everything looked a little different against the Patriots. I thought he was a little more comfortable. Uh, 18 for 31, 194 yards. That's 8.3 yards per attempt. And Josh, this was a team that was a couple special teams blunders away from breaking that whopping 20-point mark. So what are your thoughts, just uh, surface level here, about going forward with someone like Snoop Huntley for a third straight game? And we, I think we do got to tip our cap a little bit that we have seen some progress from the, uh, I think he's in his sixth year, hit the sixth year quarterback. Yeah, and I can't remember if he's uh, younger than – I can't remember his age. He's, cl he's cl close to this – okay, 26. So that, I think it might be the same age as two times below. I knew there were some kind of similarities there. But, I mean, honestly, what we've seen from one – you know, the first start that – or not start, but the first uh, action he saw against, what, the, the Titans from the game versus the Patriots, you absolutely saw the progress there. So I know Mike McDaniel says he's been studying the playbook this entire bye week, trying to become – um, you know, have it as you know, almost second nature to him. So – I'm intrigued to see what this next uh, second start, I guess, under Mike McDaniel, but his third action this year uh, looks like because I do think that there's some things to his game that, again, a Tua Tumalo might not bring and absolutely not a Skylar Thompson or at least not with the shackles on him. So i um, intrigued to see what Snoop Huntley can do against, again, a Colts team that we're going to talk about that is fighting you know, tooth and nail to win some games. What are your thoughts on Snoop Huntley, Jake? Because um, I like the way they utilize his legs in that first game. I think eight carries, 40 yards, only carried the ball three times in this last one. would like to see more of that. What were your early thoughts on Snoop Huntley? I really liked him not running the football as much in the second game. It seemed like against the Titans when he was running, it was kind of when the offense was in helpless scenarios. And what they did in game two is I feel like they did operate, they, they built scenarios in plays where if something broke down, here's where we can get you a receiver open eight years or yeah, eight years downfield, eight yards downfield. And that's why I think someone like John Smith had such a strong performance. I think this is like, like the Dolphins scored 15 points. I'm not going to try to blow smoke everywhere and the Dolphins are back and all this stuff. But the issue early in the season when the Dolphins were on that three game losing streak, it was that there was no growth. It was that they weren't trying different things. It was just shot in the foot after shot in the foot. I think that Patriots game, we saw an aware Mike McDaniel really focus in on how Tyler Huntley prepared and operated in that first game and then started to slowly build the offense around it. Um, Josh, I think you had a quote where uh, the, the hitch plays, the, um, the the quick hitting plays that the Dolphins do where there's not really a step back. It's really snap the ball and, and send it. That's something Snoop, I think McDaniel was saying, Huntley has never done before. So so those are just some interesting developments I've seen. And Josh, my apologies for all the um, you know Seinfeld references, but you, you brought up Skylar Thompson. And I see Spencer Rattler. I, don't get me wrong, the Bucks put up 50 points. But you saw Spencer Rattler, dude, moving the football for the Saints, uh, coming in as a fifth-round rookie. Was Skylar Thompson basically when George – in that episode of Seinfeld where he just showed up to a job and started working one day and then the boss came back and he showed him the Penske file and he opens it and then just nothing was done because like watching 
Skylar Thompson performed, go 13 for 19, 170 yards and get sacked five times, uh, 107 yards and get sacked five times. It really looked like the, the, the I can't even think of the name of the boss at, at that uh, company, but it's like he opened up that Penske file and there was just nothing inside of it. It's like, Skylar, you've been here, you've been here for three years. What, what, what is going on here? We, we got nothing. Yeah. And I mean, I hope there's more that we, you know, don't see behind the scenes with his progress, but I mean, it's just crazy when you see one rookie quarterback after another, these late round darts. I mean, I think we even joked Jake a couple of times about Spencer Rattler because uh, he went to school with Chris Greer's son at South yes. Carolina. So th there were jokes there. We were, um, uh, his logo's hilarious too. So I, I mean, I, this moving forward, we absolutely have to throw a dart at a quarterback, but again, I think the dolphins truly did luck out when they realized they needed to go find somebody and they ended up getting Snoop Huntley, who again, through two weeks, Three, I guess he's been here a month now. Through a month has um, looked better than Skylar Thompson. I don't know if that's testament to Snoop Huntley or you know whatever the what's the opposite of a, the you know to, to, to Skylar Thompson. Matt Flynn, maybe something like that. A quarterback who can come in yeah. for a game and drop like six touchdowns, something like that. You don't want to be a I, starter. I remember. I wanted that Joe Philbin Matt Flynn connection so bad when I, we realized it was going to be jo Joe Philbin. Uh, someone from heaven. Dude, I would grasp one to any, like, we, I'll be the first one to admit I would have no problem with the Hopium, but God, that was bad times. So you wanted Matt Flynn, they brought in Greg Jennings, like, they, they, had, they had a squad. <laughs> that is not, that's not what I wanted, but that's what I came to terms with, and I remember, you know, okay, Joe Philbin, the package deal, him and Matt Flynn, and like, even Joe Philbin was like, no, I don't want Matt Flynn. <laughs> oh, man, God, we were so. Somehow, the Dolphins did enough. I, I think, Josh, can we agree that the Dolphins did enough against the Patriots? Uh, they scored 15 points. 15 points is not good enough. But I think when you consider the penalties, the special teams miscues, I, I think they did enough, right? Yeah, yeah. They left points out there, and I think they could have, you know, won that more convincingly for sure. Although, again, Drake may look pretty good. So I think I go back on that stance where if they would have threw him out there, we, we might have been in for a whole different story. And, Josh, when you consider that Jacoby Brissett and that offense had two opportunities, opportunities to march down the field and win that game you think drake may wasn't going to launch a ball 60 yards downfield and, and see what could happen that is absolutely horrifying and josh you think back the dolphins could not do anything in the two minute drill and the big reason because of that is because they're just really down on edge rushers uh the Dolphins currently average less than two sacks per game. Jalen Phillips is done for the year with an AC inj ACL injury. We've all looked at Bradley Chubb as the savior to that pass rush, someone who can come in and really just give it a true boost that it needs. So Jacoby Brissett doesn't have all the time in the world to sit in the pocket and lead two potential game-winning drives. But man, not the most promising news from McDaniel today regarding Chubb. It doesn't sound like he's going to practice this week. It sounds like he's going to play this year. But Josh, where do we land in a situation like this? It goes back to the whole Mike McDaniel thing. Like, is he saying something or is he not? I mean, my first takeaway was, oh, my God, like we've been expecting Bradley Chubb to come back later in the year to be that saving grace. And based on everything I've heard, like, I, I'm not sure if that's the case. McDaniel said, I don't expect to see Bradley Chubb this week. Like you said, as far as weeks moving forward, we'll see. He was then asked if he'll play again this year. The way he's attacked and come back from a serious injury, I'm optimistic that I will for sure see him just because we haven't had any setbacks. So, again, he went on to – it's a Mike McDaniel answer, right? So there's probably another three or four paragraphs here where I think I slowly started to turn my uh, – my feelings started to turn a little bit. So I don't know if we're going to see him. I'm hoping we see him, what, 11 sacks last year. It was playing out of his mind. And, again, we need him now more than ever. So um, if there's ever time for Bradley Chubb to come back, it has to be within the next few weeks. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be this week. Miami actually has a few decent opponents, but if, if – we get another three, four weeks with this, and it's still not answers or we're expecting him to start doing things, that, that it might get a little queasy. I'm going to hang so tight on the words for sure that McDaniel said because that's the closest thing to a timeline we can get. Josh, speaking of lingering injuries and setbacks and things like that, Isaiah Wynn, Mike McDaniel said he had some lingering things that did come out that, that weren't the quad residuals in the human body. Stress in one area can lead to stress in another. Woof. For Miami's starting left guard, Josh, it does not sound promising that we'll be seeing Isaiah win in the next couple of weeks at the very least. No, and shout out to Omar Kelly. I think he like basically just asked, you know, we were expecting him to be a starter or, you know, pretty much to be have our, some type of role this year. And we haven't seen him what's to come. And yeah, woof, woof, woof is what we hear. So again, another player that we're sitting here looking at all these nice players on the IR. I had a whole list written out, Jake. I mean, River Craycraft's also another one, which they did not touch on, but when you think about the offensive line and maybe getting Isaiah Wynn and that added boost that he could bring, I mean, he looked very solid 
Um, yeah, that didn't sound good at all. So it just seems like another Mike McDaniel, uh, Chris Greer signing though, right? He's injured. He's not out there and it's just wasted money. Although I guess it's not that much money. It's not that much money, but it's wasted effort. You could have had somebody out there practicing. You could have given a $4 million contract to someone else who could have stepped in and be a game changer. These are the things where I'm getting a little queasy just about the long-term process of the Miami Dolphins. The fact that you needed Skylar Thompson to have, you know, the game action to go out there and be like, oh, crap, he's this bad. And the fact that you re-signed someone like Isaiah Wedden and we're in the middle of October and there's just no direction in sight. It just seems like these are some massive warning signs, Josh, that I don't think we can really sweep under the rug being year three. No, and there's no way that that was their uh... – antidote for losing Robert Hunt, right? Like, there's no way they were like, okay, we'll be okay with Isaiah Wynn and these other guys. Like, Brutal. it's just making me more angry. So I do think eventually down the road, Jake, we're going to have to come to that episode where, you know, they're asking for Chris Greer or Mike McDaniel. But for now, um, we can keep on injecting the hopium, just not for Isaiah Wynn or Bradley Chubb at this point. I'm going to inject some hopium about River Craycraft, and that's a very depressing line to say in general, but uh, I'm going to do it. So nothing was said about him. I'm kind of feeling that he's someone who could return this week, and he's going to be someone you're not going to see. Oh, no, here comes River Craycraft, two touchdowns, you know, five receptions for 60 yards. But I think he's another step in the right direction for this Tyler Huntley offense that wants to run the football. I think he's somebody you can trust. He can catch the ball in a short area, and he's going to block his tail off. So, Josh, this is one of the guys that if we want to inject some copium, let's get hyped up for River Craycraft. I know that sounds a little corny, but when you think about how this Miami Dolphins offense operates and if they want to get better at the bubble screens and then just the short yardage type situations that they need to lean on when you have some like Snoop Humpy starting River Craycraft. He's not a savior, but he can definitely, definitely help with what the Miami Dolphins are trying to do. Yeah, I had to write his name down there because I mean, I feel like, like you said, he's not the savior, but I do think this offense will, you know, get obviously to a time I love coming back is going to change everything. But, you know, having River Craycraft out there, Odell Beckham Jr. is still getting caught up with the offense. Right. He is that consistent guy, you know, so I, I'm I'm here for uh, River Craycraft coming back. And, you know, I do think he's uh, losing him probably. We, we felt it more than we might have expected. So glad that hopefully he'll eventually be back. But um, when you're looking at that list, like you said, and saying River Craycraft, come save us, it, that's a little bit sad. Did we feel it harder than um, Grant Du Bois' helmet or like like Robbie Chosen's helmet? Because they felt it pretty hard when you just get a ball to the face if you don't want to catch it. Yeah, that – and I'm a I'm Robbie Chosen stand, so you're trying you're trying to get me to talk bad about my boy, and he'll be back in like what? He'll be back a couple of weeks, most likely. <laughs> <laughs> Under new alias, he'll have enough different name too. <laughs> oh my god, dude, you're right. <laughs> That's so funny. Dude, I, I love your stance on that. Um, A couple other names, and, and this kind of all goes together with, with the secondary here, that I think is going to be pretty important against the Colts. Josh, Cam Smith, he's still on injured reserve. They activated Beckham. He's a name that I think we could see activated this week. Patrick McMorris, safety, he's another one who's on injured reserve that I think could be back sooner rather than later. And Josh, I think the Dolphins might need these guys. Jordan Poyer, he's still out with a shit injury. Um, and then Javon Holland. Something I want to point out here, Josh, and let me know if I'm being a little too crazy here. Just like um, there was a warning sign when Xavier Howard was out with not groin injuries, but groins injuries. Like, should we like, should we feel a little more confident that Javon Holland isn't the report that he has a broken bone in his hand, not necessarily a broken hand? And, and, and follow up started to question you here. Does that even make a difference? Am I just being stupid? I don't know. You, you, all those questions need to be directed to those fake Twitter, do you know, the Twitter doctors, the fantasy guys, like they're arguing with like uh, the players' dads. He was like arguing that. with Christian Wilkins' dad. Could you believe oh, – dude, like, that, was, that blew my mind. There was the an nerve. actual Twitter doctor trying to argue with Christian Wilkins' dad who was just like, dude, like he was in a hospital. He's – You'd say, yeah, you'd have to ask him for sure. But I did see Javon Holland. I don't know if he deleted it, but he had some kind of like tape or a break. Like it wasn't a hard cast, but it looked like. So, again, I don't want to go down that rabbit broken hole, but he bone. posted that. And I, so, bone. we, yeah, I don't I don't know. We still haven't heard anything. And, you know, Mike McDaniel also said that he is not against him playing with that club. So I just picture Snowman coming back in the wintertime right around Christmas. With, um, hopefully a lot sooner than that. But you know what I mean? Rolling around Christmas time with this big-ass club on his hand knocking balls out. So, what are your thoughts, Jake, on this? I, I hate that I mean bring this up, but it's just that type of season. But I see a lot of people saying, should the Dolphins trade Javon Holland because he's in a contract year? Everywhere he, I see him doing a podcast now, I believe, with uh, Cam Wolf of NFL Network, and he's wearing his athlete's first shirt. We know he's going to get absolute bank. I think Antonio Winfield was at 17.1 million, I believe. What are your thoughts on if the potential 
a tr potential trade arose, like, I guess my question to you is, are we more closer to trading Javon Holland away than we are to re-signing him to a future deal? And that just makes me feel really sad thinking about losing Javon Holland and just that current state of that safety position. Holy moly, man. That's a tough question. Um, I think you're at a spot where you keep him because – the moment you decide to trade him, you decide the season's not necessarily worth it, right? The second you're moving on from someone who can just turn or force turnovers at will, a, a very stout defender. Yes, you can go on YouTube or, or Twitter and find those plays like the DK Metcalf 70-yard touchdown where he just ran right by Javon Holland and melted him. But at the same time, Josh, I don't think Miami is going to be in a scenario where we can say like, all right, we're ready to move on and tank. Because... Even if Miami is sitting there at, like, I know this better than anyone, and Dolphin fans should too. Even if you're sitting there at 5-7, and seven, you'll see that cornucopia show up during the Thanksgiving-type games uh, that week going into uh, December. And at 5-7, and seven, Miami will still be in the hunt. And we'll say, well, they dealt with all these injuries early in the year. Javon Howard had a broken hand. Everyone's healthy. We're ready to get this going. And I just don't think the Miami Dolphins are going to reach a point. I'm not saying they're going to make the playoffs or, or – yeah come back and make everything great. What I'm saying is I don't think they're going to be bad enough to the point where they can stomach a Javon Holland trade. I think that's going to be a scenario. He's going to be, I think, kind of leaned into maybe like a franchise tag type guy for a year or something like that. Josh, where do you stand? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm torn between it because, um, again, this is a player that I think we all absolutely adore. I have to note that I think a lot of this might have came up because Pro Football Focus, they did an early, like, yeah. top 50 free agents next year, and Javon Holland was listed at number one. So, I mean, when you think about that, again, you think about how we lost Christian Wilkins, uh, Robert Hunt, you know, it's not really Chris Greer's thing to, you know, foresee these guys and, you know, sign them ahead of time. So I think he's going to end up hitting – free agency at the end of the year and at that point i mean if the dolphins could bring him back i'm all for it but i had to make sure i brought that up because i mean i know a lot of dolphins are down for the way he's played these first few games but you got to look at the long picture and this guy's what is he 24 he's a very young player plays a p premium position and i just keep joking man freaking uh brian flores is going to end up uh, getting a head coaching job and he's going to go f uh, follow him there and going to be his all pro minka fitzpatrick type player when um when we bring up players the Dolphins didn't resign, I think we definitely got to start putting Andrew Van Ginkle in that mix, and that that's no fault of you, Josh. But I mean, just just like I think at the it is a fault you, though because right now we could use Andrew Van Ginkle. Like, damn you, Chris Greer. He'd lead the team in sacks. He'd lead the team in interceptions. And I think what's crazy is I don't think we ex we nobody expected him to lead the league or, or be a team leader in sacks, but just the consistency from a down to down basis. And you're hoping he could do it for an entire year. So that's been so damn impressive, but man, Javon Holland, just thinking about all the money the dolphins have given out and you have Jalen Ramsey. He just got paid. And I know people are poo pooing that. And then you go look at his stats and he's been absolutely awesome. Josh. I mean, Javon Holland, 12 games last year, he's played five games so far this year. Um, uh, Last year he was awesome. If he, dude, if he completed the entire season last year with his three forced fumbles, the ninety-nine yard interception, like there'd be a case. But the injury stacked with the injury this year and a little bit of bad tape, he's gonna get the bank. He's gonna absolutely get bank. But I think Miami is kind of in a spot right now, especially with the being the final year. There might be eyeing that comp pick a little bit, unless he if he comes back and is an absolute world beater, then things absolutely change. But but I I don't think you can sit here right now and say let's go in top five money and, and be not queasy about it. Yeah, and you got you got to wonder how much is ever evolving. You know. Stop a defense coordinator, right? That we have a new defense coordinator in yeah. every year. So, how much is that impacting his play, and how much is that impacting their ability to want to pay him long term, right? We got this new system in. Is he going to be um, that premier safety in Anthony Weaver's system, or is he going to be that in Vic Fangio, Josh Boer? So, um, I Salas? guess I could see it from that perspective. <laughs> they, oh, nice. I, I keep joking. Deion Sanders and his son are going to, that's going to be our defense coordinator. He's going to bring his son at quarterback. But I don't know, man. Yeah, Robert Saw, that would not be bad at all. But I like the way Anthony Weaver's been playing. Anthony Weaver's on the field? Coaching. <laughs> Coaching. I, I realized I hit mute, and I'm like, you dumbass. <laughs> no, man, I, I totally agree with you. I, I think the Anthony Weaver experience has been pretty solid so far, and I don't think it's really fair to, like – Pretty the, solid the Rob, so far. <laughs> Bob Sala's been kind of a joke, but or, uh, the, we've been joking about it. I don't know if we can sit here and say, like, he should come in right away. I, I've been pretty content with Weaver, but, man, th those late – game situations especially like the pats game you got to figure out a way to generate a turnover or do something that that's going to be the biggest weakness for the miami dolphins moving forward and I, i'm interested to see how they can combat that with all the injuries turning the page to what was a very interesting football sunday josh 
This was supposed to be the week that Anthony Richard was supposed to return to the lineup for the Colts. And since the Dolphins play the Colts this week, I kind of spent a little extra time watching these guys, just trying to keep an eye on what they were doing. Um, Richardson was ruled out late in the week after being a game time decision with a quad injury. He suffered, excuse me, a few weeks back. Uh, We went through the week with Anthony, seeing how he was feeling. Uh, Coach Steve Steichen said, and obviously just wasn't there yet. So we went with Joe. And Josh, what Joe did is he clawed this team back into the game to beat the Tennessee Titans. He's completed 71 for 108. Wow, I'm sorry. I'm a mess. He completed 71 of 108 attempts so far this year for 716 yards. Scored 10 unanswered points yesterday to beat the Tennessee Titans. Josh, this is a very unique quarterback situation that is being played out with the Colts and you just got to be a little jealous. What do you think about the Miami Dolphins? And, you know, we were speaking about Skylar Thompson. Yeah, but this seems like a damned if you do, damned if you, I mean, like, I don't know what what we're rooting for here. Right. uh, You know, Anthony Richardson's kind of already been, you know, early praised as this young up and coming quarterback. You know, he has that mobility to him. We've been terrible against mobile quarterbacks, but then you see Joe Flacco out there. Again, I say he's dropping back looking like John Unitas. I obviously it's the uniforms, but I mean, he's just like off his back foot, heaving up just, uh, touchdown passes. And it's 2024. This guy's older than me, and it's just insane what he's still doing. So I almost want to lean towards, you know, Richardson not having experience uh, coming off the injury, right? He's I think he was the emergency quarterback in this game. Having him coming off of being out a little bit, I would like to see the Dolphins' defense be able to, you know, just attack, 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 because Joe Flacco, he's already in a midseason playoff form at this point. So uh, how do you feel? Do you have a preference if it were between those two quarterbacks? I mean, and do you even make the move at this point? I mean, Joe Flacco looked at, like you mentioned, man, uh, pretty damn good, and the Colts' offense definitely needed that with so many injuries. They were absolutely – depleted and they still found a way to pull this one out Flacco has seven touchdowns to one interception so far this year Uh, put up 27 points against the Pittsburgh Steelers in a win put up 34 points and three touchdowns and no interceptions against the Jaguars in a very very wonky back and forth game and Josh we could go we could play the game hey the Dolphins beat the Jaguars the Jaguars beat uh the Jaguars beat the Colts, so the Dolphins should be good against the Colts. Until you look at what happened last week, being yesterday, uh, the Titans beat the Dolphins. The Titans lost to the Colts, so the Dolphins should lose to the Colts. The logic is always there. Um, and he completed 22 of 38 passes for 189 yards, two touchdowns, and an interception against a very, very tough Titans defense. Josh, this is a great question. I wonder if it has more to do about the Dolphins than it does the Colts, because I look at how the Dolphins can get to the quarterback, and they were pressuring Jacoby Brissett, but at some point you need to actually get to the quarterback. And you think about these two guys, what would a who would a pressure impact more, Joe Flacco or Anthony Richardson? You kind of argue that it should be Joe Flacco because he's older and Richardson's got that mobility. You have Zach Sealer and Clias Campbell, arguably the best one-two punch at defensive tackle. You think the Dolphins should be able to bring some pressure from the interior. I also go back to those games where uh, Joe Flacco was starting for the Jets a few years ago, and the Dolphins were able to kind of, not kind of, but kind of clamp down those games because they had that interior pressure. So I look at Sealer and Campbell as like the X factors, and that's why I want Joe Flacco out there because he is a little older. He doesn't have the strength to really – he needs to step into his throws in the pocket. pocket excuse me. We saw him uh, just straight up miss some throws yesterday. So to me, man, I think Zach Sealer and Class Campbell could be a complete difference maker against Joe Flacco, who's limited in the pocket. However, Anthony Richardson, if you blow up that pocket, he's just going to run to the outside. And we've all seen Miami Dolphin edge rushers and linebackers chasing around um, quarterbacks, tight ends, running backs, you name them at one point or another this season. Yeah, I thought that was a little bit of a trick question you said about the pressures. I think as soon as he senses that pressure, right, he's going to get all happy feet and he's probably going to uh, make big plays happen. So that is a testament to what he can bring. But I did have this stat run down. It comes from NFL Pro. It said uh, Flacco was 15 of 26 on passes under two and a half seconds for 100 yards, two touchdowns, and interception. He was sacked zero times against the Titans. So, um, again, he gets the ball out pretty quickly. So, I mean, that's one of those situations where can the Dolphins get to him in under two and a half seconds? I mean, uh, y- you got to wonder if they can get that pressure off the edge. And we got to wonder if this is Chop Robinson, right? Every week we're going to sit here and say, watch Chop Robinson, watch Chop Robinson until Chop Robinson finally makes those plays. So um, I-, I guess I, c- I still think I lean Anthony Richardson, but that's going to be the dumbest thing I say. And he's going to have what, like 100 yards on the ground, four total touchdowns, and 
you know, again, it's going to be all over TV. I think we said that about Tony Pollard the other week, and lo and behold, there he was. When the Dolphins played the Titans, you kind of liked the mystery box aspect of Will Levis. And I think he he was a mobile on, on his feet. He ran for a first down. I think he actually got injured running for a first down. But you liked the mystery box of him just, what, he threw an interception to Emmanuel Agba's crotch, I think, pretty sure in that game. Like, that's what you really liked to see out of Will Levis. And you knew when someone like Mason Rudolph came in the game, you're like, Jesus, he's just going to get the ball out quick. He's not going to try to do too much and be a hero. It's weird that I'm flip-flopping here, Josh, because Anthony Richardson in his second year, you kind of think he's going to try to do too much and he's going to try to be a hero. I just don't know if this Dolphins defense is as equipped. And I know that's crazy to say I felt differently a few weeks ago against Will Levis, who's got a little mobility. But with Jalen Phillips out, with you trying to figure out things on the pass rush, I kind of like leaning into just letting Campbell and Steeler get in Flacco's face and let them kind of decide things. Because, man, if you have a guard pulling for on a Richardson run and you have Chop Robinson trying to save the day, it's just going to look really ugly, man. I, I can already see that being such a disaster. So it, it, it's a weird flip-flop, but, but I think that's where I stand. Yeah, I'll probably keep going back and forth. And I don't know that there's any right answer, right? We're going to – whichever we choose is going to – no. Um, another guy I want to throw out there and just – they did allow 146 yards rushing. So, I mean, there's another aspect. I mentioned uh, Tony Pollard, Tajay Spears, how they gashed us. They did the same thing to the Colts. But um, to me, Jake, I continue to remember October 3rd, 2021, Mo Ali cox two touchdowns against the Dolphins. He had four receptions in week six. Looks like, you know, one of those streamers at tight ends that you might be able to plug and play in fantasy. But I just continue to think about what he did to us before and what he could absolutely potentially do to us, um, you know, this week with how, you know, a state, you know, just how bad the Dolphins can be at times, you know, covering tight ends and things like that. I kind of like the idea of having like a hard hitting Elijah Campbell or a hard hitting Marcus May out there over like a Jordan Poyer against like a Gigantor, like a Mo Alley Cox dude's just like the biggest beast. Was he, is he six, six? Did you say that? I'm sorry. I'm not sure. I, I, I uh, black, blacked out. I was, I couldn't even spell Mo Alley Cox's name right yesterday. I kept trying to find out if it was one touchdown, two touchdowns. I kept spelling like a, the Colts are a very interesting team to watch throughout this entire week. He's six, five. Oh my God. Yeah. Six, five. Insane, dude. What what an absolute monster at tight end. This is a team that you're going to have to watch throughout the entire week. Jonathan Taylor, he missed this game. And also, man, have you heard anything about this Michael Pittman story? So he threw his back out against the Jaguars. It's been a lingering back issue he's had. And the tone throughout all of last week was the idea of like, all right, we might have to put him on injured reserve. Their bye week isn't until December. So it's we got to give them some time to rest up. And I think even Schefter brought up the word, the dreaded words I are. Uh, he decided, you know what? No, I'm, I'm going to play through it. I guess there wasn't a uh, risk to really uh, make it worse. It was just you're going to be dealing with a lot of pain. So Michael Pittman is going out there. He had a big catch uh, against the Titans to help the Colts win that game. It'll be interesting to see. You have Michael Pittman. He's going to be on the injury report. Some other wide receivers are there. Um, Anthony Richardson, the idea was, hey, he sh- they were thinking he was going to be able to play. He was throwing passes as of Friday, which he definitely wasn't doing the week before. Um Pittman, this back injury. You got Jonathan Taylor. He was out. You had Trey Sermon start for the Colts at running back. A lot, a of, lot of moving parts here, man, for a, a Colts team. And it's it's weird to look at when you think the Dolphins are this one team with just the worst injury luck. Yeah, I mean, we, we feel so bad about how we uh, how down and out we might feel. But some of these other teams are suffering just as many injuries, I guess. Um, so I'm, I'm just expecting, right, John? Taylor to be back healthy. Um, you know, you'll expect Michael Pittman to have a huge game. Josh Downs, great first name. Uh, he's on my fantasy team. He played absolutely insane this past week. A guy co injury, I think he is. Have. He was going to be out yeah, co injury, and then he saw Michael Pittman's uh, back injuries. Like I, I can't. I got to be out there and play. Like I, oh, it's crazy. God. It's crazy. Ad Mitchell. I don't know if the rookie's really done much, but I mean, they got some playmakers there. So I just, this is going to be one of those games. And now, now I'm still in my head, just going back and forth. I'm thinking about all these weapons with. Uh, Richardson, I'm getting a little bit worried. Those with Flacco, I don't know that I'd be as scared. So, um, again, we're going to be in for a treat this weekend. Josh, fi- final answer. One word, Richardson or Flacco? Four Who I'd prefer, right? Who yeah. I'd prefer? I'm going to regret Richardson. I'm going to say Richardson. I just keep saying it. I'm going to say that he gets happy field, turns the ball over, but I'm going to have egg on my face for that. That is it. That is all we have today on another Dolphins podcast. Thank you all so much for joining us. Josh, it felt real weird having the bye week. It's been fun pushing out all these shows. We will keep them coming throughout the entire week. If you're enjoying what you're listening to, 
please, please, please hit that subscribe button, leave a like, leave a review. That stuff helps others find the show, which we appreciate that. So thank you all so much for joining us. If you're enjoying the show and you want to watch us live, maybe not live, pseudo live, YouTube TV, 560 WQAM, you can find us there. Thank you all so much for listening. Go have a wonderful week. And most importantly, fins up. Fins up. Fins up. Fins up.